Uh, okay, well, we're just waiting for the slide to appear. I guess I'll just introduce myself. Um, so my name is Megan Tenick, and I am a recent PhD graduate of the University of Western Ontario, uh, which is located in Canada. I am also currently a postdoc there. And I'm really, really excited to be speaking uh, at the Gemini Science meeting today. My um, relationship with Gemini started in 2011 when I was an intern at Gemini North and my PhD thesis heavily folk, er, heavily featured um, Gemini data. So this is really, really nice to uh, be speaking with you. I only wish it was in person. Um, I was all set to be there in person and I got COVID recently. And so here I am in Canada, uh, well past my bedtime, but happy to be speaking to you anyway. Um, so this talk is going to uh, highlight some of the results from my recently accepted paper, which I wrote in collaboration with my PhD supervisor, Stan Metchev, and also uh, Kelly Hood, Greg Mace, Jonathan Fortney, Caroline Morley, Daniel Jaffe, and Roxana Lupu. And as was just mentioned, uh, this project features um, some brown dwarf data uh, that we took with iGRINS on Gemini South. Um, Oh, there we go. Oh, too far. <laughs> uh, so um, since this audience has very broad expertise, I'd like to start with a quick reminder of what a brown dwarf is. Um, brown dwarfs are formed in the same way as stars, but they are substellar objects, meaning they don't fuse hydrogen. Uh, we have three classifications for brown dwarfs, the hottest of which are the L dwarfs, uh, the middle temperatures are the T dwarfs, and then the coolest ones are the Y dwarfs. And all brown dwarfs are cool enough to host a variety of molecules in their atmospheres and brown dwarfs, like giant exoplanets, have really complex cloudy layered atmospheres. Um, so this cartoon shows what those cloud layers might look like. Uh, the hottest objects over here on the right uh, side of this uh, image have the fewest molecular species and colder objects over here on the left have more variety. Uh, Jupiter is also shown here for comparison. Uh, and you can see the similarities between Jupiter and the colder brown dwarves. Um, so this makes brown dwarves excellent laboratories for understanding atmospheric physics and chemistry of giant exoplanets. Um, so spectroscopically, this means that we get really interesting spectra with deep, broad signatures of molecules like water, carbon monoxide, methane, and ammonia. Um, so the top spectrum I've shown here is an M dwarf, and it looks approximately like a black body. Uh, below it is an L dwarf and below that is a T dwarf and both of these spectra are a lot more complex than the M dwarf. Uh, Jupiter is again shown here for comparison. Um, so if we want to understand brown dwarves well, we need to be able to mo accurately model all of these complex cloud structures and different molecular species. Um, so some context for the project I am presenting today, uh, when we're comparing uh, observations to models, uh, incomplete physics, missing lines, inaccurate line positions uh, can make detections of molecules and uh, determinations of parameters like radial velocities, projective rotation velocities, very difficult or even impossible, especially in low signal to noise observations of exoplanet atmospheres. And if you've ever tried to fit a um, model spectrum to a cool brown dwarf, uh, you know this can be very challenging. And if you haven't, I'm showing, showing an example from my 2021 paper here. Um, so if you look at the residuals in the bottom panels here, you can see that uh, none of the models fit the data perfectly. Um, there are problems in both the continuum shape and in the line positions, even in the most up-to-date models. So this means that you get different physical parameters depending on the part of the spectrum that you use. So this is where iGRINS helps us. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to use iGRINS, it is a fantastic visiting instrument on Gemini South, which captures the H and K bands at a resolution of 45,000. And it's perfect for brown dwarfs um, because their flux peaks at these wavelengths and the combination of iGRINS excellent throughput and the size of Gemini South gives us an opportunity to get a really high resolution spectrum of a brown dwarf. And brown, brown dwarfs are often very faint. Um, and high resolution spectrum are the key to assessing the accuracy of the line lists and spectroscopic models that we rely on to determine different uh, parameters. Um, I'm really excited about the next talk uh, in which uh, He Young Oh will be discussing iGRIN's northern successor, iGRIN's 2. And uh, coming up later in this week, there are some other talks about iGRIN science and there's some posters as well. So you should check those out. Um, so iGRIN's is a very special instrument and the discoveries that I'm about to present would not have been possible without it. 
Um, so the goals of this work were to use our high resolution, high signal to noise spectrum that we obtained of a T6 dwarf with Igrens on Gemini South to test the reliability of the most up-to-date atmospheric model spectra and molecular line lists. And since I only have another 10 minutes for this talk, I'm gonna quickly overview our project and our results. Um, so in this work, we compared our observed spectrum to the most up-to-date models to, as, to assess their accuracy. Uh, we used our observed spectrum to validate the newest water, methane, and ammonia line lists. We uh, detected trace molecules like hydrogen sulfide, and we identified new signatures of molecular hydrogen beyond the usual collision-induced absorption. We were able to validate the physics assumed in our atmospheric models, and we were able to identify disequilibrium chemistry effects. Uh, we were able to determine the abundances of molecules and determine which wavelength regions of the models provide the most reliable and consistent results for physical parameters. And finally, we provide a detailed near infrared spectroscopic atlas with thousands of identified absorption features. Um, so this work has been recently accepted to MNRAS and is available on their website and on archive if you want to check out all of the glorious details. Um, but for today, I'm just going to highlight the things shown in red and focus on the methane, hydrogen sulfide, and molecular hydrogen. So this is our Igren spectrum that made all of this amazing science possible. Um, we observed the brown dwarf 2 mass J0817 with Igrens. It is a T6 dwarf, which is fairly nearby at a distance of just 2.1 parsecs. Uh, and it has an effective temperature of approximately 1060 Kelvin. And to the untrained eye, this might look like a noisy spectrum, but in fact, the signal to noise at the peak of the H band is 300. Um, so all of these things you're looking at that look like noise spikes are in fact absorption features. And I'm gonna show you those in detail in the coming slides. So we're interested in knowing how the various parameters obtained from our model fits change with our choice of model, wavelength and dominant molecular species. So let's start with an overview of the entire H band. Uh, the top panel here shows a model spectrum, oops, uh, jumped ahead, <laughs> uh, separated out by each molecular species. So the way that you read this is the molecule at the bottom is gonna be the dominant molecular species at that wavelength. So here water is the dominant molecule. Uh, the panel below is just the data that I showed before. And I'm gonna show a panel like this with um, the different molecular species on every spectrum I show today. Uh, also, I've highlighted the shell orders of the Igren spectrograph at the top here. Since we wanna know how different molecules affect the fitting, uh, we fit the models to each order individually. So just very narrow wavelength uh, ranges rather than fitting to the entire wavelength coverage at once. Um, <laughs> having a hard time steering here. Uh, so the models that we fit are the BT Settle models of Allard et al., the 2012 models of Morley et al., the Sonora Bobcat models, and a custom set of models that we're calling the Sonora Bobcat Alternate A models that use all of the same underlying physics and pressure temperature profiles of the Sonora Bobcat models, but with updated methane, ammonia, water, uh, water line lists. And the alternate A models were assembled by Callie Hood of the University of California, Santa Cruz. And in our highlights today, I'm gonna to start with discussing the methane line list used in these alternate A models as they have the most apparent uh, and dramatic effect on our model fits. So we're gonna zoom in right on the center of the spectrum where methane is the strongest observer. Uh, so again, the top panel here is our Bobcat alternate A model split into different molecular species. Uh, the middle panel shows our Igrens data in black, as well as our Sonora Bobcat model in blue and a an Bobcat alternate A model in red. So I'd like to remind you the only difference between these models is the choice in the water, methane, and ammonia line list. All of the other physics is the same. And you can see that the older methane line list used in the Sonora Bobcat model actually has a shift or a stretch in the positions of the deepest features. So it lines up well, uh, oops, it lines up well here on this feature, but as you go to shorter wavelengths, these uh, features get more and more offset. But the newer methane line list used in the uh, alternate A models actually corrects for this. And this is something that we would have overlooked at lower resolutions. It would have been harder to disentangle this. Um, the lines would have been blended. So thank you again, Igrens. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Um, so this is going to be really important for determining the properties of brown dwarfs and knowing the accuracy of the line list is also important for exoplanets. The identification of molecules in an exoplanet spectrum is usually done with a cross correlation. 
So I'd like to show you how much the newer line lists actually improve uh, cross correlation. Um, so again, in blue, we have the Sonora Bobcat model with the older methane, and in red, we have the alternate A model with the newer methane. And in this case, the new methane gives us uh, not only a higher peak in the cross correlation, but it gives us a narrower peak, and the positions of the peaks are actually a little bit offset. Um, so this is really important for brown dwarfs and exoplanets. When an observed spectrum combines the um, light from a star and a planet, individual lines from a planet can have signal to noise of less than one. So your ability to uh, recover a planet or detect a particular molecule is only as good as your model. I see the five minute warning, thank you. Um, so the inaccuracies in the line list are going to affect the parameters that we derive. Um, in our brown dwarfs, for example, it's gonna give us uh, offsets and radial velocities. It's also going to overestimate our projected rotation velocities or V sine i's, show you what that looks like. So I have added a, another plot here to uh, the slide that we looked at before that plots V sine i as a function of wavelength. For each uh, a measurement made in each of the Igrin's orders for each of these four models. And you can see uh, here uh, at the short wavelengths and over here at the long wavelengths where water is the dominant absorber, the V sine i values are fairly consistent. But here in the middle where methane is the dominant absorber, the V sine i um, uh, values are completely discrepant. The only model that is um, consistent the whole way through the wavelength coverage is the, the Bobcat alternate A model with the newest methane line list. So our takeaway here is that the older near infrared methane line lists are inaccurate. If you want to study brown dwarfs or exoplanets, you're going to need to look, use something like high temp uh, that is updated. So now I'd like to zoom in on a different part of the H-band and show you a really exciting discovery. Um, so we have a very clear detection of hydrogen sulfide in this atmosphere. Uh, with a complete model, it's a little bit hard to see the effects of the hydrogen sulfide. Um, the hydrogen sulfide line is here in purple, and you can see that it's quite weak compared to a water line below it that it'll be blended with. Uh, but we did something kind of clever. Whoops. <laughs> where we removed hydrogen sulfide entirely from our model. So now the signature of hydrogen sulfide is really apparent down here in the residuals. Um, so to accurately model the observed spectrum, hydrogen sulfide must be included in this model. And this is the only convincing detection of hydrogen sulfide in an extrasolar atmosphere to date. And it's actually very important because the presence of the presence of hydrogen sulfide validates the assumption of rainout chemistry that is used in these model atmospheres. If rainout did not occur, the sulfur would all be locked away in iron sulfide and we wouldn't see any hydrogen sulfide at all. So this is really important to tell the modelers that we're actually getting the physics in uh, inside of these brown dwarf atmospheres correct. And it's another discovery that wouldn't have been possible without icons. So now onto the K-band. Um, I want to zoom in on this part of the K-band here and show you something that we have actually never seen before. <laughs> uh, so we noticed in this order that there was a line missing from the model. It's very clear down here in the residuals and it turns out that uh, this feature actually matches the one to zero S1 transition of molecular hydrogen to six significant figures. So our next step was to add a molecular hydrogen line list to our model and to check the fit. And it turns out that it fit very well. Um, so I've overlaid the same uh, Bobcat alternate A model here, now including molecular hydrogen uh, in red. And you can see in the residuals that this line has disappeared. And this uh, molecular hydrogen feature is actually among the strongest uh, emission lines in things like shocks, planetary nebulae, and young stellar objects. But this is the first time that we've ever seen it in an extrasolar atmosphere. And by comparing to the dust concentration and extinction of the interstellar medium, we can actually place a limit on the dust content of the outer atmosphere of this T6 dwarf. We found it has to be at least 500 times less um, than the interstellar value, meaning that this atmosphere is effectively dust free. So um, the molecular hydrogen line wasn't the only feature missing from our models, but it was the only one that we could identify. Um, I've shown here another order where we have a line in our spectrum that is missing from our model. So this means that we're not done with brown dwarf atmospheres. Even though our models are very good, there's still stuff that we need to work on. Uh, so I'll just wrap up here. Um, this Igrin spectrum is a very important benchmark for brown dwarf and exoplanet science. 
We're finding that um, atmospheric models that use state-of-the-art line lists represent our observations really well. And we're now able to do much more interesting things with our data than merely detect the most abundant molecules. Uh, we can detect trace species that we've never seen before. We can see low abundance species and we can more readily detect um, the abundances of species, which I didn't show here, but is in our paper. Um, in our paper, we also offer a list of recommendations and warnings, depending on uh, which fit parameter or molecular species you are interested in in your data. And I'd like to highlight that I only showed four out of the 49 Igrins as shell orders in this talk. There is so much more to see in our paper, the highlight of which is our 25 page Igrin spectroscopic atlas with thousands of identified absorption features. Um, so again, this paper has been accepted to MNRAS, is available on their website and on archive. We've also made our Igrin's spectrum publicly available if you would like to check it out. And a quick shout out to the Other Worlds Laboratory at the University of California, Santa Cruz and the Heising Simons Foundation for funding this work. So thank you very much and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, very interesting. Um, questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering that um, H2 detection that you made, um, are there several lines in the Igrin's bandpass that you'd be able to detect? Um, I'm asking with the ulterior motive of seeing if you could do that with a cross correlation for a hot Jupiter exoplanet. <laughs> yes, great question. Um, there are other lines in the Igrin's wavelength coverage. Um, unfortunately, they are a lot weaker uh, than the one that we found in, in our data. Um, so I went and I investigated and I wasn't able to um, tell if I, we were actually getting a detection of the other weaker lines or if they were just getting lost in the noise. Um, I think if you tried to do such a cross correlation in an exoplanet, the that one at the wavelength that I showed in this talk is going to be your best bet. Um, it is the first time we've ever even seen it in like a brown dwarf atmosphere. But um, I think if you had an exoplanet that's about a thousand Kelvin, where this line is going to be quite strong, and you have very high resolution, high signal to noise data, maybe <laughs> this is probably not what you wanted to hear. But <laughs> it's it's hard to detect. <laughs> Worth a look, though. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, is there a hand up? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, again, if you prefer, you can, even, even if you're in the room, you can ask questions via Slack. Um, anyone on Slack? Okay. I had a question then um, with the H2S, what was the abundance of the H2S? Could you measure that? Yes, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but we were able to uh, measure a column density from our models and compute the um, abundances that way. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but we did a comparison to, uh, there's no other H2S measurements in brown dwarfs. So we did a comparison actually to um, a published value we found for Uranus uh, because there's H2S in its atmosphere and um, the abundance here in this brown dwarf is higher, uh, but I don't know the number off the top of my head. Sorry, <laughs> it's in our paper. Okay, actually that that's kind of a follow-up would be, yeah, is that H2, the 2.12 micron line, is that seen in, in giant planet, in our, in our planets? Yes, so um, uh, the the uh, the subtle thing in my statement of this is our first detection is it's our first detection in an extrasolar atmosphere. So this line has been seen in um, Jupiter and in uh, Saturn as well. Uranus and Neptune are just too cold, I guess, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, um, you need for this particular line um, the best chance. Or the the transition likes to take place at about a thousand Kelvin. So I think that maybe they're a little too cold. I, I mean, Jupiter and Saturn are colder than that too. But um. yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's partly why it's so weak, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, one more. Wait, how long did, was the integration on Igrins? <laughs> Oh, uh, it was on my other slide. I think it was almost four hours. Um, and this is uh, actually, I'm just going to go. Can I go back? Yeah, because I have the magnitude on that slide as well. Where is it? There it is. There's a slight delay between changing the slide and actually seeing the change. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. Not four hours, almost three hours. So 2.6 hours on Igrens. Um, and this is a magnitude of uh, about 13 and a half in the H and K bands. So. 
it's uh, this this is one of the brightest t late tea dwarfs that um, we can possibly access, uh, and it's because it's this bright because it is only two parsecs away. Okay, great. Thank you. Last call. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank Megan again. Thank you.